All right, viewers, welcome to the Black Agenda podcast, another live episode. We are really, really excited to bring you these live episodes. We know in season one, y'all were used to just, you know, kind of listening to us. But this year, we wanted to kind of do something different so that you can actually really get an opportunity to meet us and an opportunity to meet our uh, special guests that we're going to be having. So our guest, as you can see on the screen, we have a very, very special individual with us, Miss Mary Elliott. She is actually a, cura- uh, excuse me, a curator of American slavery at the Smithsonian Natural Museum of African American History and Culture. So we're really, really pleased to have her here because everybody knows the Smithsonian. Everybody, if you haven't gone to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, you really, really need to because it is amazing. It's beautiful. Uh, and she works there. She actually co-curated the museum's Slavery and Freedom inaugural and Exhibition and is a team member of the museum's Slavery Works Project. Uh, Ms. Elliott, she actually curated and wrote the special broadsheet section of the award-winning New York Times feature publication entitled The 1619 Project. Everybody, I know you know The 1619 Project, so that's really, really big for us to get to talk to someone who actually helped to you know, develop that. I think everyone kind of knows about Nicole, who really brought the project you know, to New York Times. But there were a lot, a lot of people who worked under Nicole to really make this thing blossom and flourish. And Mary Elliott is one of those individuals. So we really, really, you know, pride her, you know, in being able to be a part of that and talking to us. And we wanted to also mention, because we're doing an HBCU awareness series, Mary is a graduate of Howard University. So we definitely wanted to make Mm -hmm. sure to recognize that because Howard is actually going to be featured in our series. So uh, Mary, you are, I I want to take a little bit of time to kind of hype you up because we're excited <laughs> to have you because you're, you're like I said special you know individual to uh, you know talk to doing a lot of amazing things so thank you for being on our show today thank you so much Adrian and um thanks for reading that bio I was listening going who's that <laughs> <laughs> but no I I appreciate um you know the intro and I'm excited to be here but I'll tell you the truth after you read everything the thing that excited me the most was the acknowledgement of the HBCUs, yeah. HBCUs, and also um, I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, <laughs> so you know I got to plug the Divine Nine too. Hey, you got you better do it. You better do it because if not, you will get in trouble. See, Devin and I we're we're part of KK Psi, the band fraternity. So anytime okay. we get a chance, yeah, we we, we got to buddy up with everybody. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but all right, Mary. So let's let's get right into it. Um, because our, our first segment we wanted to kind of you know theme this as the romancing of slavery. And the reason why is because in our in our first uh, season, we kind of talked about if you look at the the textbooks, you look at education in America, for some reason we want to think slavery wasn't really that bad and you know wasn't you know a thing that we need to worry about. And, and when you get straight to it, you know, the majority class in our society really denies the effects of slavery point blank. You know, even textbooks, like I said, try to kind of fade it out, and make it not look as bad. And when people talk about trying to, you know, mend the relationship, the reparations, whatever the case may be, you know, people kind of shake their heads and people say, well, we can't really do anything about it because it happened so long ago. So our first question is just something really general. When you've got, you know, people really just uh, deny the effects of slavery and how they affect, you know, Black communities. Can you explain to us, you know, how that's a problem for, you know, really, really trying to amend Black communities when people can't even accept that slavery was an issue? Well, there are a lot of things that go through my mind, and I'm going to try and present it as succinctly as possible. But um, just going back to the 1619 Project, what's powerful about that is I um, worked on the broadsheet section, which was the newspaper section that featured the story of slavery and freedom through objects and themes and stories. Where Nicole and a team of scholars and poets and writers did the magazine, which really connected that foundational part of the story of slavery to our present day. What's the legacies of slavery? What are certain things that we can connect back to slavery? Right. And one thing that comes to mind for me is we talk about the majority folks who may not know this history or who deny, as you say, this history. But working at the museum, what I find is, yes, there are people who deny the history, but there are a lot of people who just don't know the history. 
just like I sat in class with my classmates who were white, Asian, Pacific Islander, Latino, African American identifying, all of us were learning together and all of us were denied a more inclusive history. And so I think it's imperative that we acknowledge that because people who come to the museum, they walk out and say, how come I didn't learn this in school? And so it's easy to deny something that you just didn't learn, right? And then for those of us who grew up in predominantly, you know, in black communities, in our homes, I know for me, my father, he made us learn all the iconic figures in African-American history during, and I'm older, Black History Week, which became Black History Month. Mm. He posted their images along with their bios throughout our house. And we had to go around the house and memorize them. Now, imagine that is supplementing my education in school. Mm. But those folks who don't have, who didn't have parents like that, they wouldn't have learned all of this. Right. And so it's easy for them to deny something that they're not informed about. Now, I'm not giving anyone a pass because truthfully, the history is out there today because of such dynamic scholarship. And what's also exciting is a lot of that scholarship, too, is coming from African-Americans who also have a kind of nuanced understanding of this history on a personal level, too. And so um, I think that it's it's easy to deny something that you don't know is out there, right? Now, how did that come to be? Because if you think about it, African-Americans who were enslaved, who weren't look, being taught how to write and read, it was against the law. They're not writing their you know, personal stories or their daily journals, although there are slave narratives out there, right? And there are some stories out there that you can find in local history repositories, but they're few and far between. And so then it comes to the issue of people saying, well, you can't get in touch with the personal stories of the enslaved. You can't find out what they were really thinking, what they felt, but you can look at the ledgers that were kept by the enslavers. You can look at the ledgers that were kept by the people who were selling people. You can look at the bills of sale. You can look at the quotas for people having to bring in so much in weight in terms of cotton. You can look at the ledgers of doctors who showed up on the plantation to repair injuries and imagine what it was like for those people who, a young child who had a broken arm or a broken leg. And you can also look at church records. And then we can also look at the WPA narratives that fill in the gap, even though they were oral histories taken in the 1930s by the Works Progress Administration. It's still the reflections of people who went through enslavement, looking back and telling their story. Some of that comes with a caveat, who was the interviewer? Was it a white person or a black person? And that also dictated how the recounting was told. But that's important to know. There are resources out there for us to know this history. But how did we get to the point that it wasn't included in the curriculum in, in the classroom? And so you got to keep in mind, after slavery ended, you have a campaign um, led by the Daughters of the Confederacy who are putting out curriculum to the schools and defining how we look at this exceptional nation, how we look at patriotism and liberty and all the things that this nation stood for, stands for, but left out the narrative of people who helped build that nation, the enslaved, mm -hmm. left out humanizing those people. And so we end up having to fill in the gap. And before I end just answering this question, the other thing that's important to note is that's, that happens right after slavery ends. But then you get to later in the 20th century, the early 20th century, you have scholars like William Dunning, who is supported by Columbia University, who's writing a narrative about reconstruction. And that narrative paints a picture of African-Americans who basically can't fend for themselves. They're docile, they need help to transition from slavery to freedom. And it paints this picture, this stereotypical negative racist picture of African-Americans. So there's the silence. And then when they do talk about us, 
it's told in a way that it puts us in a negative light, right? And so I think that's important to acknowledge along the way how the story has been told and how it's not been told. And acknowledge that all of us learned sitting next to each other. And there are many folks in the minority and the majority classes who didn't learn. And, and I think all of that goes into, you know, kind of the second question, which was, you know, how has the dominant society been so successful in changing the narrative, which you, you know, essentially explain that with a with a campaign. Uh, essentially to rewrite uh, history and how it's going to be told and taught to future generations. And, you know, one of the things that I've heard before is that like African-Americans have been victim of the, the greatest PR campaign in history because of the false narratives and images that have been depicted and whether it's music, you know, video, movies, whatever, we were always depicted in some kind of negative light. You know, you always go back to Birth of a Nation and how the, the South Carolina you know, representatives and elected black officials were depicted as being you know, stupid and they, they didn't know how to legislate and govern. And so, you know, a lot of times we hear people tell us like, you talk about race too much. You talk about slavery too much, like get over it. You know, you're not a victim. They always try to say that African-Americans are being victims when we talk about our history essentially. And so I guess the question is why are people uh, not people, the dominant society, why are they so, why does that conversation make them so uncomfortable? You know, why do people avoid the conversation of slavery and race and what it means for the world that we currently live in? Well, I'm glad you brought up Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation was screened by Woodrow Wilson in the White House, <laughs> you know? Um, and so what does that say about the president screening Birth of a Nation, basically, um, demonstrating that, you know, that is the national narrative, yeah. right? And so that's kind of, it's very disheartening to think about that, that that's what was put out by our leaders at that time, right? And it painted a picture of ignorant, lazy, violent Black people, right? Um, and also with that, you had scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois and others who tried to change the narrative. You have Carter G. Woodson, whose, whose complete effort was to educate people on African-American history, to educate people on the history of the transatlantic slave trade, African-American history, the truth of the history that includes human suffering, but the power of the human spirit. It includes the accomplishments of African-Americans. And it wasn't just tilting it just towards, this is all the great things that we did. It was telling a more inclusive story about our lived experience. And then W.B. Du Bois came along behind William Dunning and tried to correct the narrative or add more understanding to the narrative, really correct it um, with regard to reconstruction. But also looking at how were black scholars viewed at that time? How were black scholars viewed at that time? And what does that mean in terms of credibility? And I'll tell you right now, I just came off serving um, my tenure as a council member on the American Historical Association Council, their board. And I'm really proud to say that they are actually taking the deep dive to look at what they did to contribute to this, um, this racist notion about African-Americans. And so they're scrubbing their records to look at what scholarship they promoted, to look at what scholars they promoted, to look at how they fed into educating the public to have the perspective that we're trying to break down now. Awesome. And I think that's extremely important. You know, um, it, it took a time like this, but thank God the time has come because not only are they looking at that, they're looking at how to correct that. And so I think that's important. Um, in terms of why people don't want to talk about this history and be talk about a more inclusive history and talk about African Americans, our contributions, the horrors of slavery, um, the realities of dividing families during the domestic slave trade, the realities of African Americans fighting in the revolutionary or revolutionary war, the realities of African Americans being both enslaved and free, the realities of African Americans being cultural social, um, political, intellectual beings. 
it's like having someone change what they've known mm. and them not wanting to, to shift that. This is what I know. How, do you, how are you going to make me change what I know? This is how I learned it. This is what I learned. And so projects like the 1619 Project, to shift that and get people to understand, we're not just telling you to change what you know just on a whim. Here are the facts. And let me show you the facts based on authentic objects. Here is an authentic letter written by a government official to raise a militia in Virginia for the sole purpose of policing black people. And at the end of his letter, he said, if you capture someone and no one comes and claims them and they don't have proof of freedom, they get at least 20 lashes. Here's the proof of a woman who was enslaved and in her, in her obituary, she was described as the good darkie who raised many a master. And oh, by the way, here's the actual photograph of her taken when she was enslaved. And here are actual middle passage shack shackles used on a young child. So small that an infant, it's for an infant. And so in terms of it being authenticated, they're tested through the Smithsonian for aging, dating it. We go through a process to authenticate these objects. And if someone questions anything further beyond the objects, beyond the photographs, all we got to do is go to the primary source documents. Go to the secession documents where they talk about the Fugitive Slave Act, I believe it's almost 18 times. So when someone says that the war wasn't about slavery, let's, let's go to the tape. Let's look at the document and see where people are complaining that the Fugitive Slave Act went into effect, but you all aren't upholding the law. You're not returning our property. That's in the secession documents. And so I think, you know, to round out my response to this question, I think that what's powerful is we, we have to acknowledge that, again, I'll keep saying it, there are people who learned alongside us and didn't learn alongside us. But yes, there is the reality that there is a majority group that they've been put in a position to believe that there's a sense of superiority, supremacy. Not all, but some have that belief, that notion. And so to have to unravel that, to have to break that down, it's a hard task for them, but it's not like it can't be done. We, we went from a nation in bondage to slavery to a nation that was pushing to redefine freedom even after we created the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, Bill of Rights, but we worked towards perfecting those ideals that were created back then. You know, you're, you know, that's powerful. That's why whenever I introduced you, I, I did all of that to kind of to amp you up because you are a powerful uh, speaker there. Uh, and that's and that's very significant. And, and we're, we're gonna take our, uh, normally we only do, um, two questions per segment since there's two hosts, but there, there's one question that we want to just get your, your brief thoughts before we go on a break. And, and that's just your, your kind of just your reactions to some of this uh, news that we've seen about states uh, banning and maybe even threatening educational funding to schools who are going to be teaching the 1619 Project. Just before we uh, take our break, we just wanted to get maybe some of your brief thoughts on that. I, I hope that that's not the case. Um, I think the 1619 is the project is a tremendous resource. Um, and I am hopeful that people will recognize its value and understand that, um, that educators, it is a useful and practical tool for educators who, just as you asked about people who don't want to acknowledge this history, it's a useful tool because it makes it plain. Mm. It just makes it plain. It's here's the facts. And how do we look at how that is impacting where we are today? And it, it draws the, the through line. It draws the line. It makes the connections. 
And so the most important thing I think about that is how do we present this history in a way that it's it's useful to everyone? Everyone sees themselves in this history, that it's a human story, it's a shared history, it's an American story, but also how do you use it to become a more thoughtful citizen? I talked to someone about George Washington the other day, and I said, you know, George Washington, I'm not going to take away from him as this, um, people call him the founding father. Um, and you know, father of the nation, but I'm not gonna take away from him being the first president from leading the Revolutionary War, creating an independent nation. I'm not gonna take away from him helping to ensure that we had this constitution, but also it's okay to look at him and, and interrogate his, his moral side or lack thereof and be able to look at him and go, okay, great. He had a change of heart about slavery after, after the Revolutionary War. But the fact is, he didn't free his enslaved people. Even though after he died, it was in his will, it still didn't come until after his wife died. Mm -hmm. And so the fact is, when we look at that stuff, we can ask ourselves, was that the right thing to do? And would I do that? And so it's through these stories that it helps us to not, not throw guilt, not throw blame, but look and be more thoughtful about how we can move forward um, better, how we can move forward and make better decisions, better choices. No, I like that. And like I said, we, I know that, you know, that was one of our uh, more current event questions, but I think what you said about how the 1619 project should be used for educational purposes to really reflect true history. I think that that's really the, the, the true message there. So thank you for taking that there. And we're going to go ahead and uh, end this. Like I said, we normally do uh, two questions per segment to each uh, have a, each uh, host have an opportunity to question our guests. So viewers, uh, stick with us. We're going to give you our first break, and then we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. So we are continuing our conversation with Mary Elliott, uh, who is the curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And so uh, we had a great first segment. So we want to get into our second segment here, kind of talking about a little bit of the aftermath of, of slavery. And so, you know, Mary, we live in a world where a lot of people have this idea uh, that you should be able to stand up on your two feet, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and all that stuff. And, and if you fall down, you should be able to figure out how to get up again. And and however, you know, we, we come from, from ancestors who were stripped of everything, um, all the way down to their humanity, their, their religion, their name, everything was stripped from them when they arrived here, you know, in 1619. So for someone with our history in this country to be told that they are, quote, free, um, you know, tell our viewers the issues that former slaves had to deal with uh, when trying to be, quote, unquote, free and how that lifestyle has been you know, kind of passed down into, into further generations. Well, thank you, Devin. And there's one thing I wanna, I want to say regarding your question. This is a great question. But one thing I will say is that um, I, don't, I don't look at us as being stripped all the way down because the thing I tell everyone is we came with empty hands, but not with empty heads. Mm. So our humanity was there within our bodies and our minds. We held on to our humanity despite the inhumane conditions we faced. And so if I were to take you and remove you from your home, you probably would not forget the cake that your grandmother made for your birthday. You probably would not forget the church services you attended. You probably would not forget the men in your community who served as leaders or were viewed as leaders and the way they carried themselves, the things they talked about, you'd remember that. And that's what these folks did. And so they were able to create 
new cultures once they got here um, that incorporated their memories and their new experience in this new space, right? The other thing is 1619 is a starting point for what becomes the United States because we look at 1619, that is, um, you know, people being forced into um, and entering into um, colonial Virginia. And that's the British colonies. The British colonies really are what is seen as the heart of what becomes the United States. But really there were people already here, both free and enslaved who had come through with, um, with the Spanish, with people from Spain. And so they come as early as the, um, you know, the 1500s. So I just wanna be clear about that. And also slavery was already going on for, you know, hundreds of years, 200 years, um, or almost 200 years prior to 1619. So that transatlantic slave trade really picks up around the 1440s, but, um, and really 15, 1500s, but it's going, the slave trade is going on out of Africa, leaving out of Africa around the 1440s. So I wanna make it clear that there's a lot going on well before 1619. Um, in terms of what happens after slavery ends and being told you're now free, and then the question is, how do you get on with that newfound freedom? Within the framework of slavery, we see the development of the free black communities and the church. And the church plays an, an enormous role in helping people transition from slavery to freedom. It's not just a site of sanctuary, it's a site for education, for organizing, for community development, leadership development, um, for so many things, right? But imagine people, for example, coming out of um, Texas. And Texas, we think about Juneteenth. And the, the order of things is 1862, you have the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation. It goes into effect in 1863. That freed people who were enslaved in the rebelling states. So that freed people in those Confederate states. Texas being one of those, right? So new word had to get out to all these people. Well, it took a war to get all the way across to Texas to get word to Texas. So Texas is one of the last states to get word about these people being freed. They were freed as early as 1863, but they didn't get news until two, you know, until two years later. And then you have the end of the Civil War in April of 1865. And it took two months after that for the news to get to the people in Texas that they'd been freed since 1863. So that's Juneteenth. And I bring all that up because the language in the general order that was read by um, General Granger, who delivered the news among, along with several members of the Union Army, including the US Colored Troop members. And so, in this general order number three, and I wanted to read this to you because it's very important to note. It says the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights, an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The free men are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts because we know they were going to the Union Army campsites and they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. So you're now told that, that you're free and you can live in your former home. Oh, by the way, that home is a slave cabin. Mm -hmm. You're free. Yeah, sure, you own your labor, but um, actually we're gonna change that up a little bit because this is between employer and employee. Oh, and that employer and employee relationship is defined by, a uh, a sharecropper contract. And so what that means is you're going to live in that, that slave cabin, but now it's your home. 
and um, you're going to live on the land you used to work and you may get a plot of land to work that land. You won't have to pay rent, but you're going to get everything on credit. And what happens is you're going to have to weigh up at the end of each season and make sure that you fulfill that promise of bringing in a certain quota. And so you're buying everything on credit. But if you don't have enough to pay off, if you don't weigh up and have enough, then that means that now you're in debt. And so now you're in debt and you have to just keep working. It's this cycle. And you're this sharecropper that's in this never ending cycle that basically is another form of slavery. And when you talk about education and how people look at African-Americans and we talked about the daughters of the Confederacy and creating that national narrative after slavery ended, here you have a general order read to the newly freed African-Americans it's put in the newspaper and it says they are informed they will not be allowed to collect at military force and that they will not be supported in idleness. Basically, that just puts out that we know y'all are lazy, but you, that won't be supported here. There will be no idleness here or anywhere else. No vagrancy. And understand, if you don't do those sharecropping contracts, if you don't do tenant farming, and black codes start popping up, black codes restricting the freedoms of African-Americans. That means that a white person can accuse you of being a vagrant if you're walking around just trying to find your way and make a life for yourself. And you then go into prison. And while you're in prison, your labor is now leased out because you're a product of the convict lease labor system. And so yet you're back out again in the plantation system. So that's just from general order number three. If you look at Sherman's order 15, which granted land to people, and it was basically 40 acres and a mule. So the people on Edisto Island in the um, low country area, they go back after being in, the, in Port Royal in South Carolina, where you see the Freedmen's Bureau, this experiment with the Freedmen's Bureau and starting, and they go back to the land that they worked that they made profitable, that they cleared, that they improved. And they basically are like, look, I'm claiming this land. I built it up. I deserve this land. You, Sherman, you, you put this order forward. I'm claiming my 40 acres. The land is given to them and taken away. Given to them and taken away. The final draw was when General Otis Howard, of whom Howard University is named after, and he was with the Freedmen's Bureau, had to go down to Edisto Island and tell the African-American community, we're taking the land back because President Johnson has ordered that that land has to go back to the former enslavers. And you will now be working that land as sharecroppers, tenant farmers. But black people showed up that day at the church that he made that announcement, 2000 of them showed up and they raise their voices in protest. And so when you think about, there are people out there who try to create an environment that would enable people to claim their land, claim their, um, their labor, have a piece of property that they could build communities on, raise their own food and become self-sufficient, produce schools and churches, and become full citizens. You had others who said, yeah, nope, sorry, can't do that. And this history ebbs and flows because it happens like that frequently. It comes up and it goes back down and we continue to have to fight against it. And um, it's imperative that we not just look at the personal stories, we not just look at the, um, the anecdotal stories, but also look at, always look at the law. And when you look at the law, look at, um, the debates that went on behind establishing those pieces of legislation so you can understand the mindset and what the intent was behind the law. And that gets to the truth. That gets to the truth. I think you're right there. No, go, ahead, go ahead, Devin. I, I, I'm no. always ready to jump in, but no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's, I mean that's, that's powerful stuff when you hear how things are given and taken away, given and taken. You're playing this cat and mouse game of Freedom, trying to attain, you know, what is freedom, you know, um, and, and so 
we we I, and our next question is kind of you know we're, we know we're still dealing with the effects of that, and so we know that the conversation now is is reparations and how do we try to compensate you know for the atrocities that happened back then, but also the things that happened after slavery, which you just went into with the black codes and vacancy laws and being free but not free, just you know, and then the the Jim Crow era came and. And you had the, the mass incarceration movement came. And so it just seemed like one stumbling block after another was put up. But now you see a real, almost almost a real movement now to, to try to really look back and see what can be done now to, to compensate and, and heal some of those wounds. And you see, we talked to um, a representative from Asheville, North Carolina, where they had voted to give their residents reparations. They're still waiting to see what that's gonna look like, but they, they did vote, the city did vote to do that. And so, you know, Congress has taken up, I think it's Sheila Jackson Lee's HR 40 bill. And so, you know, we we know this, but, you know, I guess our question, I don't know, if you, it, it's a broad one, but there were generations we know of unpaid slave labor. We saw what happened with, uh, you know, Black Wall Street and Tulsa being, you know, burned to the, to the ground, you know, billions, millions and billions of dollars of black wealth was lost in Tulsa. And, and you get redlining and discrimination in the financial industry that we're still dealing with. And then, you know, the chronic underfunding of black schools and, and HBCUs as well, universities. And then we get the mass incarceration movement of the 90s. Could we even put a dollar amount on that type of sustained discrimination and racism against one group of people you know that's our you know our question can do you think we'll ever be able to really effectively heal some of those wounds with something like reparations um for me i can't speak for the museum about reparations on a personal note um i think the key thing with reparations is to recognize the harm and seek to repair um, an answer as to how to do it, I don't know offhand right now. That doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means I, I don't have the answer. I think it would involve bringing together um, a group of folks who are experts, econ economists, um, educators, and others. I, I always lean towards education is, is extremely important. Access to education is extremely important. Um, and access to other things. But I honestly can't tell you that I know the exact answer. And that's okay. But I, I do believe that it is in, important that we do something because um, you have a group of people who, black people, whose contributions to this nation, um, beyond just saying helped, it's foundational to the development of this nation. That's economically, politically, socially, culturally, intellectually, physically, spiritually, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, um, and it cannot be denied. It's measurable, it cannot be denied. You can look at the different contributions people um, gave to the development of this nation. And then you can also look back and see where certain rights have been denied to us. And so what is the impact of all of that? And I think that goes back to your question too about how people may not wanna talk about some of these subjects because it turns all of us, the 1619 Project, for example, turns everything upside down on, on its head because it's such a, it's a, a really looking through a lens and going, hey, look, Look at the connections where sometimes, even amongst black folks, we'll look at something like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, you know, um, Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, some of the things that are like iconic and that we know. But what about some of those really local stories, some of those really other personal stories that even we think we know everything, but <laughs> there's some of us who are learning. There are many of us who are learning new things, right? Um, and so I think that, that that's important. Um, I can't say what to do on reparations. I do think that we need to recognize the harm 
and work towards the repair. How to do that, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head right now. But I do think that it would require pulling together a team of experts to really get down to the nuts and bolts of um, looking at how it could be done and why. You know, the why is not just it was bad, but why it needs to be done so we can look at why education is important, why access to land is important, right? Um, so that would be my answer off the top of my head right now. No, that's, I mean, that's a great answer because I think it gets to the heart uh, of us addressing uh, the issue and it's really looking at the repair. Uh, because when you look at, you know, because I'm from Newport, Mississippi and my mom, you know, single mom, four kids, uh, food stamps kind of thing. Uh, she had Section A housing. And when we lived in Section A housing, one of the things that I was able to see is that if you look at Section A housing and you may look at like a picture of a plantation, you may forget what you're looking at because they look so similar. It's just another system uh, from welfare uh, to different economic levers that, you know, we just have institutions that have been in place on our people that we need sort of repairs, whether they be reparations. Uh, we've even seen, we did a, a, a report last week where there's uh, in Virginia, there's a new legend, a new law where the universities are going to be uh, doing reparations in the forms of maybe grants and uh, uh, college tuition and things like that. So there are a number of different ways to kind of rectify these law, uh, wrongs and, and these atrocities that you know that we went through. But I think you're absolutely right. It's going to take us all, you know, getting on board and coming together. And, and, and you know, pull it, you know, putting our bootstraps on like we've been talking about and, and tackling this issue. So what we're going to do, Mayor, we're going to take our last break. And when we come back, we're just going to get your final message just to kind of wrap up our episode. We always like to say, leave it with a good big bow for our viewers and listeners. Well, uh, can so, I add one thing? Yeah, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. The other thing is that when it comes to reparations, it's also getting to the human nature of other people thinking that folks are taking something from them. That is a big thing that has to be addressed to understand that it's not taking something away from someone else. It's providing opportunities for everyone. And FYI, my family is from Oklahoma and they had hundreds of acres of land. They had a bank, a hotel, a chain of department stores, a theater. They were, they were involved with the National Negro Business League and their second department store was burned down in the Tulsa race massacre. And so all of these rights that were given to us, 13th Amendment, end of slavery, 14th Amendment, due process citizenship, 15th Amendment, voting rights, ability to um, hold office. From, I think from the time slavery ends, there's this constant sense of they're gonna take stuff away from us. Mm -hmm. And failing to realize if it weren't for this, the, the labor of the enslaved and the contributions of African-Americans, there wouldn't be stuff to be take, taken away. No, thank you. That, I, you know, that's, that's awesome that you point that out because we've said that so many times. And, and, that, and you hear those dog whistles throughout you know, our politicians when people talk about you know, you know, immigrants come in and take your jobs and things like that. There's always this fear that's been placed on the majority class thinking that the more we're you know, liberal, the more progressive we are as a nation, the more they're going to take away from you. They're going to take your guns and take all these other things. So thank you for, for pointing that out because that, that is awesome there. So viewers, we're going to give you our last break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to get uh, Miss Mary Elliott's last thoughts. So stick with us and we'll be right back. All right, viewers, let's go ahead and wrap up our time with Mary Elliott. Remember, we've got an awesome, awesome individual with us doing our interview talking about the 1619 Project and Slavery, uh, Miss Mary Elliott. Remember, she's a curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Now, Mary, we always like to end our uh, episodes with a good final message, uh, kind of as a way to just, you know, send our episode off to our fans in a great big old bow. And just to kind of set the stage for your final message, here it is. Um, you know, we just got done with a president who kind of had this idea to start the 1776 Commission 
to somewhat almost counter the 1619 Project and a way to kind of further bury the actual truth of American history. And, you know, we have a lot of Americans who feel very, very patriotic about our country. Dev and I, we're both patriotic about our country as well. But some people feel that slavery just is an issue that shouldn't be rehashed. It's just a stain on our democracy almost. Um, they see it as just something that should be left in the past. However, for people like you and I and Devin, I mean, you know, our communities, we can't forget about, you know, these things. We can't forget about it until our country really tackles the issue. And speaking to one of the main messages in your exhibition, Slavery and Freedom, you talk about a shared experience. And we at, a, we at the Black Agenda, we try to use our platform to talk about this shared experience and talk about the way societal issues really slow, rather our issues slow down societal progress because we are all working together. So our, our last little thought for you and kind of leave our listeners um, and to kind of help our political leaders, maybe even give them a little guidance and education. Um, what can we do and what do you need from everybody to really understand this shared experience concept that y'all are trying to talk about? Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. Here's what I think. I'm not trying to sound kumbaya. I'm not trying to, you know, be idealistic. Uh, I'm telling you from my experience, being in the museum, putting this, this the exhibition together with my colleagues, the co-curator was Nancy Burkall, who is um, a dynamic scholar in her own right. And she is now the chair of the political history department at the National Museum of American History. And another two other colleagues um, who contributed, um, they were Sion Woldemichael and um, Rex Ellis, who was our Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs. This was an experience putting together the exhibition, very important. But there were many people along the way who, all of us, it was a learning experience. And this truly is a shared history. When you look at a bill of sale, you don't just look at the bill of sale and just see the black person who was sold. You see the name of the person who sold them, the name of the person who bought them, and the names of the people who witnessed the transaction. So in terms of genealogy, black people are the only ones who need to look at that document. There are white people who are descendants who need to look at that document. And while it may be hard to acknowledge that their family members were in, in tangled in that, that transaction, it's still their history, our history. And it's important to know this history, to know the true story of our nation, right? Because it informs us to be better citizens. It's not just learning it for the sake of look what you did. It informs us to be better citizens. It also informs us about how we got to where we are now. It informs us about why people wanted to keep black people in their place within the framework of slavery and then after slavery ended. It informs us about the stereotypical racist views of Afri towards African-Americans, how they came about, why they existed, where they originate from, even when it's hard for people to acknowledge that it's also based in the church, in faith systems. It's embedded in our foundational documents. 1850, Fugitive Slave Act, it speaks to slavery. 1803, the expansion of the nation with the Louisiana Purchase. Why did that matter? It enabled us to cultivate more cotton and become more economically powerful, which gave us even more political power. So when you learn about 1803, Louisiana Purchase in school, you just kind of think, oh, Louisiana Purchase, it's like everything else I learned, but no. <laughs> it speaks to slavery, right? How does it connect to everything else? How, how does the 1807 end of our involvement in the international slave trade speak to slavery? While it ended our involvement in the international slave trade, it didn't end slavery. And so what did that mean? It meant the domestic slave trade took on greater importance. So we learned these things in school, but then we realized this all went towards developing the nation. And then we realized, okay, 
So slavery ends and reconstruction amendments are created. But then you have people who are like, I'm not ready for this nation to change. This, this nation, I like it the way it was. And so I'm gonna find ways to hold on to some things. And I'm gonna create this narrative. You asked me a question earlier about, um, it was something about how African-Americans and the history and how it's been told to us, but it's been told to all of us, right? And so one thing, the word I would use is, um, it's kind of like this big gaslight. It's like a big gaslighting experience. <laughs> like we've been told a certain narrative and, it, and it's like, no, actually here is the history and it's not getting rid of the rest of the history that's told. It's retelling in a way that it is, um, it's, it's inclusive. And even you recognize the, recognize the racism in the history that's been told, not just look at correcting the history, but also look at how the history has been taught, how it's been told, right? And I think what's most important is for all of us to recognize that we all learned in a certain way and we're all learning it in new ways. Mm -hmm. And what's really important is that it's authenticated with, um, with facts, the facts in material culture, the facts in oral history through the narratives of people who live through this experience, the facts in the actual writing of the people who created this experience, the facts in looking at how the narrative was recreated by the time you get to reconstruction, looking at the history of the daughters of the Confederacy and the intent behind how they wrote their the curriculum. Look at all of those facts. Look at the facts of where people wrote unapologetically. Look at local history records where they wrote unapologetically. We stuck the ballot boxes because we weren't going to let, and I won't say the word, win this election. It's written. It's in newspapers. And people wrote unapologetically. They just said what they were going to say because they didn't think by 2021 someone would come along and be like, what? <laughs> They probably thought the system would stay in place. And so the truth is there in their own words. Why do we need to know it? Again, I look at it as we need to know it so that we are informed about how we got to where we are, that there is a legacy of slavery that still exists with us today. And then thinking about how we can correct it and thinking about how we can be better, more informed, more thoughtful citizens. And that's for everybody. So when I say more thoughtful citizens, that even goes for policymakers, that goes for human resources directors, that goes for black people who have the right to vote. No, you are absolutely, I like that. And I really, really love uh, the, the part how you talked about the, the bill of sale and how, how so many people are involved in that. Because a lot of people just kind of see that, well, my, my, man, my ancestors didn't sell, you know, slaves or didn't own slaves or whatever the case may be. But, you know, you're saying that because of that, there were a lot of people who witnessed it also on that. Um, and that just really just speaks a lot of volumes to uh, that shared experience, not to mention the fact of when you learn about this, you learn about, you know, what, you know, what not to do and how we can be better citizens, like you said, and be a much, much better society by, you know, rectifying these wrongs and making sure that people, you know, have a right to life, liberty, and, you know, pursuit of happiness, which our forefathers actually thought that they were giving everybody. So uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, spelling that out. Devin, uh, well, Adrian and Devin, just one last thing. Our museum has had bipartisan support. It had bipartisan support, even though it took 100 years to come into being. It was an original idea in 1916, but it was George Bush who signed it into legislation. It was um, Barack Obama who cut the ribbon when we opened, but it was bipartisan support. And the people who come to us, the experts in the museum and ask for support, it's Folks like, you know, some folks might be surprised, Senator Wicker, who's like, you know, look, I want to write um, something that acknowledges the contributions of Hiram Revels, you know, the first African-American elected into office, right? Mm -hmm. And and other people, for example, um, looking at Congressman Norcross from New Jersey, right, who wants to talk about Juneteenth, wants to talk about Harriet Tubman. It's a cross-section of people who are all looking at this history with new eyes. And I think that we have to acknowledge that and work with each other 
to continue to push to get this history out there because there are people out there who are making the effort to make sure that people know the truth and know the, co the comprehensive um, inclusive history of our nation. Yeah, and, and that's why we're grateful, absolutely grateful to have people like you who are willing to you know, stand up and, and tell that story uh, unapolog unapologetically with the facts, you know, to back it up, you know, of what happened. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate again, Mary, just like kind of like Adrian said, uh, this is powerful. And then for people listening and watching, you know, you know, be a more informed, you know, citizen and understand that this journey that we're going on, looking back on our history, uh, we have people next to us who are also learning it as well. So we have to keep that in mind when, you know, people may not understand certain things and, and why we see it that way, understand that they got a, a version of history too, that they're trying to retool in their head and, and, and re-examine and say, well, maybe I didn't do that exactly the right way because of what I was you know, taught in school. So we have to all understand we're all in this kind of together. And so uh, Mary, we appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, we know we, this was, this is again, a learning experience for us. You know, we've, we've said this numerous times but we feel like we're in a, a college course almost like, yeah, I had to, know, I, like, <laughs> I kept wanting to chime in and say, oh, wow, I didn't even know that, but exactly. <laughs> we should keep track of how many, you know, little, little facts. We're like, yeah, I didn't know that either, but hey, no, we, we, we <laughs> I just like you. <laughs> <laughs> no we we really do appreciate it you you bring it like we thought and you laid the facts out there so i think people will really enjoy it maybe this will change some minds as far as the 1619 project you know it is i don't know why it's controversial but it is controversial to some people and so hopefully they'll get a hold of this interview and understand that there's real work that went into this and it's not to rewrite history it's to tell it like you say in a different way in a different lens. And so uh, we just appreciate you giving, giving us your time. And AJ, you got some last thoughts before we go? No, other than uh, Mary, you are awesome. Um, we thank you so much for being uh, with us. Uh, I know our viewers and our listeners are going to be very appreciative of your words. And we hope that we can elevate your message to a level that more people can get educated and learn about the shared experience. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. This was this was fun. I enjoyed the conversation and I can't thank you enough for providing this platform to extend, you know, share in this dialogue. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So, all right. Well, again, viewers, this is Mary Elliott. She's a curator at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. So we thank you.